Okay, this is a talk about the macroeconomics of stratification. We have Professor Stephanie Seguina with us. Um, would you like to introduce yourself, maybe start the talk? Sure, thank you. Take Thanks state. for having me. Thanks for hosting this. Sorry you can't see me. Maybe that'll be fixed at some point. Um, my name is Stephanie Seguino. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Vermont in the United States and also a research associate at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, so I, I'd love to uh, continue on uh, and expand on some of Derek's themes, especially as they relate to macroeconomics. And I, I wanna reiterate uh, the major point and the, sort of the major frame of stratification economics, which is that the dynamics of inequality, intergroup inequality, are best understood as a struggle over the distribution of income. I'm um, sorry. Um, I think we might have a, a solution for the the camera issue. Um, yeah. The the CEO here he said if you leave and rejoin the stage, it should update your camera and microphone. Okay. I, you might have made some change. So good luck. <laughs> Apologies about that, guys. <laughs> um, I hope Stephanie is coming back. <laughs> You're back, but cannot unmute. Um, that's even worse than before. <laughs> um, uh, try fiddling. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, no, I see you again. Okay. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Maybe um, we should just uh, live with uh, yeah. lack of yeah. video rather than. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, Sorry for the interruption. No worries. No worries. Uh, so I, I'm going to just reiterate sort of the, the frame of stratification economics, which is that uh, they are best understood as a struggle over the distribution of income, wealth, and ultimately well-being, all of the manifestations of well-being. And in what, what we understand from stratification economics is that dominant racial, ethnic, and gender groups use two mechanisms to secure their privileged position. <clears throat> Those mechanisms are exclusion or what we could call opportunity hoarding, as well as exploitation. And by that, I mean exploitation in the Marxian sense of paying a person less than the value of what they produce. And the, the struggle over dominance extends beyond labor markets and micro level uh, uh, phenomena to the macro economy in ways that influence the distribution of income and resources uh, via state policy or macro level policies. Um, so racial and gender hierarchies then influence output and growth in the macro economy. Uh, the role that inequality plays, by that I mean gender or racial inequality, uh, depends on three factors. The characteristics of job distribution uh, with a hallmark of stratified societies as job segregation by both race and gender. Uh, the structure of the economy will mediate the relationship between intergroup inequality and macroeconomic outcomes. And the macro policy environment itself uh, will influence that relationship. And in particular, I'm referring not only to monetary and fiscal policy, but also the degree of regulation of financial labor and product markets, as well as trade and foreign direct investment policies. So one of the things that we have learned in this work on the macroeconomics of stratification, if you will, is that there is a bi-directional relationship between distribution at the micro level and macroeconomic outcomes. And that is, in particular, macro level outcomes and policies influence intergroup inequality and at the same time, intergroup inequality 
has implications for the rate of economic growth, economic stability, and so forth. And I think the best thing to do is to do the, to share to explain this to you by example. Uh, and so I'd like to give you an example of each. That is of the uh, the influence of intergroup inequality on macroeconomic growth and macro level policies on intergroup inequality. So let me start with the first, and that is the effect of gender and race stratification on economic growth. Um, what we find is that uh, that exploitation is a phenomenon in the as a result of job segregation. Uh, that is artificially lower wages and work conditions for those in subordinated groups. The effect of that macroeconomically is to stimulate profits in those industries in which these groups are concentrated, artificially lowering product prices and stimulating aggregate demand. And I would argue this is most accentuated in export led economies or export oriented economies. I mean, taking two very simple, very sort of well-known examples, of US slavery, as well as the apartheid regime in South Africa. In both cases, the lower non-existent wages paid to workers in these primary commodity export-oriented economies held down the cost of production, stimulated demand for goods produced by blacks in both cases, stimulating investment and exports and thus growth. Uh, let me give you another example, one that really is based on the research that I have done uh, and that relates to the case of South Korea, but also many other semi-industrialized economies. But taking the case of South Korea is useful because South Korea is an ethnically homogeneous country. And there we see that, uh, that racial, racial stratification is less the dominant form of stratification than is gender. Uh, and the, the, ev the empirical evidence that we have is that gender stratification was one of the causal factors in rapid South Korean growth. And I'd like to just elaborate on this so you understand the process and methodology of stratification economists. Uh, it relies on sociological um, research uh, as well as macroeconomic uh, research. So in, in South Korea, a patriarchal society, uh, women's role has been to provide the unpaid labor of caring for the immediate family and the husband's family. And in that system, uh, it, it was only tenable for young women to enter into labor intensive jobs in the manufacturing sector. Um, they were excluded from jobs in the higher wage sectors of the economy. Uh, again, these were export oriented jobs. Uh, there was a marriage ban so that when women became pregnant or got married, they were fired from the factory. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, this weakens their bargaining power because their tenure is shortened. And I should add that the influx of young women into these jobs in South Korea uh, was uh, into the export industry was intentional. They were barred from higher wage jobs, crowded into export sector jobs. And at the beginning of South Korea's export led growth, their wages were roughly half those of men. Uh, and they are not much higher today, by the way. Uh, and they so this, this, this processes artificially held down women's wages. Those low wages were uh, depressed export prices. This stimulated export demand. It thus generated the foreign exchange to purchase the imported capital goods necessary to move the economy up the industrial ladder. Uh, I think it's useful to understand that women's low, low wages substituted for or complemented exchange rate devaluation, thus cushioning men, including male workers from the otherwise higher costs that imports would have, uh, have that, that imp uh, higher cost of imports that would have resulted uh, had women's low wages not devalued the exchange rate metaphorically. Uh, because of the type of the industry women are employed in, that is labor intensive manufacturing firms, these firms are much more mobile than the male sectors of the economy, even male export industries like automobiles. And, it, and that, bar, that, that meant that firms have differentially more bargaining power over workers in female dominated export industries than in male dominated industries. So it's these structural relationships combined with the norms and stereotypes of patriarchy that were, have been a stimulus 
to uh, so South Korean growth, and I would argue it in a number of other countries as well. Um, I want to go on and give you an example of the other direction of causality. It's one that very much interests me right now, and uh, especially given politics around monetary policy. Uh, and I want to talk about the role of contractionary monetary policy. Uh, in many, in, as we have seen the emergence of globalization and financial deregulation, uh, one of the hallmarks of this is that wealth holders uh, want lower inflation. Uh, why is that? Because it raises the real rate of return on their investments. And so we find that contractionary mon monetary policy is used even at very low rates of inflation, driving up interest rates, used to engineer a decrease in aggregate demands as a way to slow inflation. Um, stratification theory would predict that subordinated groups bear a heavier cost of this policy. And the evidence supports that. Research by a number of scholars, both in the US as well as doing work on developed countries, finds that both blacks and white women in the US, for example, experience a much larger decrease in employment as interest rates rise. And in the US, black females and males experience worse effects than white women, followed by the least effect on white men. And here, uh, what I'd like to emphasize here is what you see is subordinated groups acting as a shock absorber uh, of economic malaise, protecting members of the dominant group from higher, uh, from harsher outcomes. Um, these macro, one of the things I think is fundamentally important is we have to understand how is it that stratification operates? What is the infrastructure of stratification? The infrastructure of stratification in part is the norms and stereotypes and ultimately gender and racial ideologies about who is deserving and who is not deserving. Uh, but in particular stereotypes and particularly negative stereotypes about uh, women and people of color uh, are, uh, or cause all of us to internalize a system of stratification. So it becomes a stealth factor in which all of us uh, that are black, black self-awareness are participants in the process of stratification. After all, when the Fed raises interest rates, the decision about who loses their job in a recession depends upon employers and, and, and their level of stereotypes that influence who they fire and who they retain. Uh, I, I, there's so much more to say about this, but I hope this has stimulated your interest uh, on this. Uh, I want to add something, and what a, a, I guess a couple of areas that I think are really ripe for additional research. One of those is that there has been some research that suggests, for example, in the United States, that incarceration rates of Blacks, and in particular Black men, is associated with economic downturns. That is, that it, again, that incarceration of black men is a mechanism for providing a shock absorber, removing them as competitors for job, scarce jobs in economies during downturns. And I think that's worth much more, um, much more consideration. But I also want to uh, uh, kind of describe to you a comment to me uh, and an observation by Sandy Darity, who was one of the leading thinkers in stratification economics a number of years ago that I have continued to puzzle on. And I hope that we as scholars can make progress on. And that is that, it, it's pot, is it possible that in racially heterogeneous societies that race bears a greater burden of the cost of stratification than gender? And is it conceivable then that in racially homogeneous societies like South Korea, gender bears that burden alone? Ultimately, what it asks of us is, um, what is the relationship between systems of stratification, both race and gender, how do they complement each other? How do they substitute for each other? All of this suggests there's much more work to be done on stratification economics, as well as the role of the macroeconomy in perpetuating stratification, or indeed, what are the tools for undermining it through macroeconomic policy? Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um would you like to answer a question now? Absolutely. Okay. Um, we have a question. Ooh. I see it. Um, yeah, we have a question from Adam Khan here. Yeah, if you want to read that. Sure. How does stratification fit with different schools of macroeconomics? 
new Keynesian, post Keynesian, Austrian, and so forth? That's a great question. And if you don't mind me just saying this, I actually wrote a paper on this topic. I'm happy to share it with all of you. It was just published in the uh, Journal of European Economic Perspectives, I believe it's called. Uh, and in, in, in that paper, I talk about the actually very close relationship between post Keynesian economics and uh, feminist economics and stratification economics. I think these schools of thought can become intertwined. And my goal in writing that paper was to uh, encourage um, post Keynesian economists to extend beyond class inequality to understand the role of race and gender. And, uh, and uh, I would say that, uh, that the foundation of the post Keynesian economics that has influenced me as a macroeconomic economist is the work of Mikhail Kaletsky and what we call Kaletsky in economics. For those of you who are not familiar with Kaletsky's work, Kaletsky was very similar to Keynes with the exception that he was very interested in uh, the role of income distribution and how it affects macroeconomic growth. And so he, he began with, and many heterodox economists have developed uh, class differentiated macro models. So the functional distribution of income is the, uh, the form of inequality. And that research looks at the impact of a, re a redistribution from capitalists to workers or vice versa on macroeconomic outcomes. So uh, I think that, that there is a lot to be gained from post Keynesian economics. Uh, uh, were it to incorporate the understanding of various pathways by which uh, uh, strat race and gender influence macroeconomic outcomes. And I could go on and on, but I'm gonna stop. It's a rich area for research. Uh, hi, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess read, the, read your paper if you're more interested, Adam. Um, I don't think there are any more questions at the moment, but uh, guys, please feel free to add any questions you want in the Q&A tab. There's a bit of an issue with the, um, oh, there's another one. I'll, I'll let you answer that if you can see that. Uh, yep, just one second. I'm actually, if you give me one second, I'm going to just post the, uh, the uh, article in the chat. Oh yeah, I'll good. There you go. Uh, how do exchange rates influence stratification? Well, that's so interesting. And it's, you know, I say it's so interesting because people have not really begun to make these connections of stratification to these macro level policy tools. Well, in the case of um, in the in the case of South Korea, as I mentioned, um, um, in, in many ways, low female wages were a substitute for exchange rate uh, depreciation or devaluation, right? Because it it, it uh, lowers the export price rather than uh, devaluing the currency, lower wages of particular groups uh, uh, result in um, sort of a, a lower real exchange rate. And it protects men, uh, especially in the case of South Korea, for example, from the negative effects of a, a devalued currency, which makes imports more expensive. So uh, it's, uh, that's one of the ways. I, I have read some other papers that are linking gender inequality to exchange rates. Um, and I think, again, that's a, an area very rich for research. Uh, so it says here, what work are you excited about right now in terms of intersectional pro approaches to macro, uh, macro stratification economics? Some of the work from uh, Jeanette Wicks Lim seems relevant, for example, absolutely. And some recent work by Marlene Kim as well. Um, I, I, it's all of this, I think this is, work is really great and I think you actually can. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we face is that if uh, getting outside of the United States to do this work uh, is made more challenging because race data is less plentiful. In fact, it is just very difficult to come by and a country like France, for example, doesn't even collect it. So the methodological approach has to be slightly different much of the research that I've done on macroeconomics and, and stratification has been both theoretical modeling, but also uh, econ econometric analysis. And we just don't yet have that tool for outside of the United States. But I, I wanna just go back to this point about intersectionality. I mean, I, when I, the paper that I mentioned that I worked on on contractionary monetary policy with my colleague, James, Hines, James Hines, 
uh, in it, we were actually able to assess the degree of the impact of contractionary monetary policy uh, on intersectionality, if you will, and particularly the impact on black women as separated from separate from black men and white women and so forth. Uh, so I, I think it is, you know, that is absolutely an important important lens. And I, you know, I can continue to think about it and how we can integrate it more into the work we're doing macroeconomically. Could I elaborate on the role of social capital in stratification economics? Well, um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just, just say that, that, um, that's a hard one for me to answer. It's not an area that I've done a lot of work in. I, you know, know what social capital is and so forth. Uh, I think that, you know, we, we certainly can think of there are many forms of capital or assets that people hold and social capital may be one of them. But I am, you know, I, I'm more, I have been more focused on, if you will, the infrastructure of stratification through norms and stereotypes. So I'm going to have to uh, elide my response to that one and think a bit more about that. But thanks for the question, and I will think more about it. Um, I see a couple more questions here. Please offer reflections on how one incorporates racial ethnic di differences into a Koletskian framework. Do race and ethnic inequality matter as a driver for macroeconomic outcomes rather than solely yet being a, a, a result of macroeconomic performance? Uh, so yes, they uh, race and ethnicity absolutely can be incorporated into macro models. And uh, I have I worked on one with a colleague of mine, Nancy Brooks, and we tried to econometrically estimate it. Uh, so it can it, it, the operation uh, is through uh, a job segregation and the structure of the economy, uh, and uh, it also if you that that matters for short run growth, for long run growth we have to incorporate the impact on um, on uh, human so called human capital or human capacities. So you can integrate this both in the long and the short run. In the model that we tried to estimate with regard to race and gender, we in particular were looking at in initial racial inequality in education uh, as a driver of economic growth uh, to determine its impact on, macro on, on economic growth. And what we found is that, um, that in fact racial equality in education was actually a stimulus to growth in our macro model and actually in our empirical um, estimations. And uh, what we have not been able to disentangle is the following, and I'll explain it because it's, the, it, it's important in understanding the role of education. Uh, yes, educational equality is likely a stimulus to growth, but uh, it may not need, lead to racial equality if in fact people in the subordinate group cannot cash in, if you will, on their educational um, attainment such that, it, that such that they are not rewarded for their educational attainment they are, that raises the rate of exploitation if you will that is uh, workers that have higher productivity but are not reimbursed for that stimulates profits therefore stimulates investment and growth and so it's really that trajectory that we have to identify and empirically uh, cement if you will with data so yes, uh, absolutely, race and ethnic differences do matter in a Koletskian framework. Uh, and I think that's an area that's very ripe for research. Uh, we have done a lot of work with gender that can inform, I think, a race, ethnic, neo-Koletskian model. And uh, that, as I said, that work uh, remains to be done. Um, what is my view of, the me of methodological individualism? Some, uh, some game theoretical approaches in stratification economics are based on individual investment and whiteness, but some traditions in macro and political economy don't rely on micro foundations. Well, I would say that I am one of those people that do not rely on micro foundations uh, in, in terms of macroeconomic outcomes. I mean, the, 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 for me, what the cements a system of stratification is not the individual, but the, the, the perceptions and the characterization of people who are members of group that overrides, that eliminates any individual assessment of who they are. 
So uh, I, I, I personally uh, uh, think that, you know, when, for example, employers go to hire a person, they are, they are operating through a, a stereotypical, a racially and gender stereotypical lens in making those decisions, for example. And when a uh, person is bargaining for a higher wage, their fallback position, uh, should the negotiation fail, is not a function of their individual attributes, maybe somewhat, but it's largely a function of the status of their group. And uh, so uh, I, the, I focus more on, I would say, intergroup inequality as compared to ind methodological individualism. That's a great question, thanks. Um, if there are any further questions, be sure to put them in the Q and A. Um, it's really good that we're getting a lot of interaction here. Um, uh, those are some really interesting answers, really interesting questions. Might I just, you know, if we have a few more minutes, just add a couple of things. I mean, one of the things that we have done, those who have been doing this macroeconomic work, is that we've been identifying these relationships macroeconomically, but there are also macroeconomic policies to that can overcome stratification, that can address it, that are uh, racially and gender equitable as uh, as compared to racially reinforcing stratification. And uh, uh, even in the area of monetary policy, for example, uh, relying on alternative macro, uh, monetary policy tools can be a mechanism for addressing racial and gender inequality. And I'll give you just one example. Um, the major tool that are used by central banks in managing inflation uh, are, are controlling interest rates. Now, the reality is that inflation in many countries is not a function of too much demand. It's a function of supply side deficiencies. Uh, the HIV AIDS in Africa that uh, devastated the labor supply in Africa, lack of physical infrastructure uh, in terms of roads, electricity, sanitation, and so forth. And so in those scenarios, really, uh, the, to solve the problem of inflation is not to raise interest rate that disadvantages subordinated groups, but rather to use fiscal policy to invest in those things that will uh, reduce inflation, that will promote uh, both, you know, as I said, a physical infrastructure, as well as the human capacities in education, social expenditures, and so forth. Uh, furthermore, uh, interest rate policy is not the only policy tool of central banks. Central banks could use a policy such as asset-based reserve requirements that direct uh, that uh, require uh, participating private banks to invest a portion of their portfolio in strategic sectors of the economy. It may be strategic sectors that disproportionately benefit subordinate uh, gender and racial groups. And the, this can be done relatively easily in which you ask private uh, banks to invest a portion of their portfolio in these strategic sectors or to park their reserve funds in a non-interest bearing account. So there are many mechanisms for addressing these problems that we have not yet explored. Thank you for that. Um, any further questions on what we've just heard? I'll just give people a second maybe to think of some. I apologize for the um, the technological issues we were suffering earlier as well. I think we have a new one, a new question. Okay. You see that? Uh, I'm gonna scroll down here. What do you answer if critics call stratification economics is normally biased? I, I don't know what to say about that. I am, you know, uh, normally biased would be to say that inequality is problematic. I, I'm, I'm good with that. But much of stratification economics is simply, is simply uh, identifying and delineating the mechanisms that produce inequality. And those are two, the tools to do that are tools that are widely used by economists. Uh, there's nothing, in fact, normative about it other than perhaps what drives our interest to look at certain issues versus others. I might say that it's normatively biased 
to ignore, uh, on the part of mainstream economists, to ignore, for example, the negative effects of economic downturns on groups that occur differentially. So I, uh, I, I, I don't get pulled into that discussion about normatively biased. Uh, I, I think, as Derek said, we all approach these issues with a, a frame. And uh, that frame might be focused on the issue of equality. Let me say the following, that it, um, even in mainstream economics today, there is, and this is, you know, the World Bank, the UN and, and others uh, are actually uh, very focused on the role of inequality uh, and its impact on economic growth and economic development. Uh, and uh, they, are the, the, they justify that, I would argue, by uh, saying that inequality is bad for economic growth so that we all benefit. It's a win-win, if you will. But uh, again, the, the focus is on the problem of inequality and there is an emerging consensus that inequality is actually bad for it, it's society-wide well-being, at least in the long run, if not the short run. Henry, are you there? Are we still on? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, th I think so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we have, uh, I think you're on for another 10 minutes is what your, what your event was. Um, so if there are potentially any more questions. I see one here. Uh, it says, are, what barriers are faced in academic economics to these ideas, uh, aware that the profession has its own issues with race and gender? Uh, I, you know, I think that, uh, let me just say generally, that the economics profession has trivialized uh, any economists that have focused on issues of poverty on uh, and race, on gender and so forth. And, and, and I would say that these economists have been ghettoized. And that, that's why I think what it's such, for me, it's been such an odyssey to approach these issues, not from looking at you know, poverty and gender and race inequality, but from a macroeconomic perspective understanding that these are racial and gender stratification can be functional to the system in terms of economic growth. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, I myself have found myself at, at an institution and in a network that has been supportive of the work that I've done. And uh, I also would say that uh, the emergence of, uh, you know, the International Association for Feminist Economics is uh, with a a very reputable journal has raised the, the visibility and stature of those of us who do this kind of work. Uh, but I also, I really encourage people to think about the moment that we're in. And we have seen, especially since 2008, with the Great Recession and the failure of mainstream economics, to, uh, which had, had been a cheerleader for globalization, uh, to, uh, we found ourselves in a moment in which I think there is some questioning of mainstream economics and its devaluation of concerns about these other issues. And I, I find it, um, you know, the stratification economics very similar to dependency theory and quite frankly, similar to the work of Bernie Sanders. And that is that rather than focusing as, you know, people who are poor, as having deficits, uh, that, we under, that we begin to explore the role of the dominant group in creating those conditions. I think 2008, uh, the, the dramatic effects of the Great Recession, and now more recently with COVID and the effects of COVID, there is more of an, an, uh, an empirical basis for which to give credence to those of us who do this work on stratification. And so, you know, um, Derek was alluding to this, and many years ago, um, Milton Friedman may, uh, you know, made this quote that, uh, that the, that even if your, your ideas are not popular and accepted at the time, that this work needs to be developed because there will arrive a political moment in which those ideas have salience. And I think that that is the case today, that, um, that we, need to, we need to understand this as a political moment. And I would say actually 2020 is a very important political moment in which there can be 
leveraged for change to bring stratification economics more broadly into um, uh, common parlance, let me say. Let me say. Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think stratification economists uh, that are doing more useful work than ever at the moment, the very divisive world, isn't it? Um, are there any further questions, perhaps? Well, let me, if there's no questions, I'm always happy to keep talking. Let me, let me yeah, uh, just say one thing that, uh, one of the things that I have actually found very instructive in the work, uh, in, in doing work in this area, is the work of sociologists. Uh, and in particular, uh, the role of stereotypes, norm stereotypes, and, and ideologies, both gender and racial, uh, for me are these sort of invisible infrastructure which perpetuate stratification. Uh, it is because there needs to be, in order to justify a hierarchy, there needs to be some kind of uh, stereotyping of the outgroup and the in-group in ways that justify the experiences of these groups. And, uh, and so I see this a great deal. I do research on racial profiling by the police. And one can't understand uh, racial, racial disparities of policing without understanding the role of uh, perhaps implicit or explicit bias that is mediated through stereotypes negative stereotypes about the criminality, uh, the, the, the purported criminality, for example, of black males, uh, that it reverberates in the minds of police officers. And I think that that work for me gives me a window into how those stereotypes infiltrate every single decision that, uh, uh, that matters economically, whether it's when you go to the bank for a bank loan, whether you, you know, ask to see a house that's for sale, uh, when you apply for a job, uh, when you apply for a leadership position, that it is that filter of stereotypes that shapes, that, that causes all of us to internally police ourselves to re-perpetuate a system of stratification. And so I, I think that economics, mainstream economics, this is where it is severely um, deficient in, uh, in understanding human, uh, human behavior. And I think for any stratification econo economist that they should take a course in social psychology and they most definitely should take some courses in sociology to understand status hierarchies and the way that that intermingles with material incentives to dominate. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got a small question myself. Could you please elaborate a bit more on the research you've done on uh, policing and stereotyping within it? I'm interested in that. Yeah, um, I uh, live in the state of Vermont. It is predominantly white state. Uh, it is the home of Bernie Sanders and Vermonters consider themselves to be very progressive people. Uh, so uh, several years ago, I began analyzing traffic stop data uh, with the police. And um, we have discovered that, in fact, racial disparities in uh, traffic policing, whether it's in stop rates, arrest rates, or search rates, are uh, overwhelmingly racially unequal, with Black drivers in particular being, uh, being singled out uh, in all of these cases. And uh, there are several ways to test the data, not only for disparities, for bias, one of those tests that I think is instructive is what's called the hit rate test. And the hit rate test basically says, okay, the police are searching black drivers at a higher rate than white drivers. Uh, police officers tell me that's because they think black and black brown drivers are the ones that are, uh, that are trafficking drugs. That, that, that's what they tell me. And I think that is an accurate statement. Um, we would expect then that, uh, that they, they're, percentage of searches that result in contraband being found would be relatively high and certainly relatively high compared to white drivers. In fact, what we find is that black drivers are over-searched, but they're far less likely to be carrying contraband than our white drivers. And so how do we explain that discrepancy? Um, uh, first of all, we know the stereotypes that drive that. We know that those stereotypes stick in the sense that 
a police officer that routinely stops black drivers and does not find contraband should recalibrate the threshold of evidence that they use to initiate search. That, that is what a rational actor would do with scarce resources. But instead, we find perpetually these higher search rates and lower contraband hit rates. And I, I would submit to you that, that, that identifies the power of stereotypes um, and implicit bias at a minimum, if not explicit bias in uh, promoting racial inequality and traffic stops. And of course, the problem with this is that the ensnaring of people of color in the, in the uh, criminal justice system by you know, arresting them or ticketing them and so on and so forth um, has ramifications for employment. <clears throat> it thus has ramifications for incarceration uh, and, uh, and with redounds on uh, families and children. So it, it is a really uh, important area to explore. I do not know if these dynamics exist in other countries. Uh, I certainly have read a lot about the UK and race and policing, but I think it is a, it's a constituent component of a stratification system is the criminal justice system and policing is part of that. Uh, thank you for the answer. That was really informative. Um, uh, what else was I, I was going to ask something. Um, you said Vermont was more of a kind of progressive state. And that's how they like to see themselves. Um, is, is this kind of racial profiling? How, have you done much research outside of Vermont in a, a more conservative state? Uh, I, so uh, often what I do is compare our results to those of other states. Uh, there's an excellent uh, researcher by the name of Frank Baumgartner at the University of North Carolina who has analyzed 20 million traffic stops in North Carolina. And there was recent, recently a national study uh, at, out of Stanford with 100 million traffic stops. And in, in all cases, disparities in Vermont are worse than in these so-called more conservative states. So the search rate in Vermont the search rate disparity, in other words, the ratio of the black search rate to the white search rate in some communities in Vermont is six to one, right? So black drivers are six times more likely, not 50%, not 100%, but 500% more likely to be searched. The national average is, is, is uh, that they're twice as likely. So actually, and there's some evidence that racially homogeneous states, and especially the Northeast of the United States, which tend to be more liberal, actually has some of the rac worst racial disparities in policing in the entire country. And that in itself is an interesting question. Is that due to the racial makeup of the Northeast, uh, where um, uh, there is less contact between whites and people of color, uh, or, or, or are there other factors? Uh, there's a whole body of research in sociology called contact theory versus threat theory. Uh, very interesting to utilize to understand how the composition of the local population, its racial composition, can influence outcomes. The argument of threat theory is that the higher the percentage of blacks in a community, the greater the threat that whites feel, uh, uh, and therefore the greater the racial disparities and the racial backlash, if you will. Uh, contact theory uh, suggests that the greater the contact is, so the larger the percentage of blacks in a community, the greater the contact is with whites and blacks, the greater the opportunity for white people to revisit and correct their faulty stereotypes, and that therefore you would see less racial inequality in more diverse communities. So that's some sociological theory that I think really would usefully, could usefully be brought into economic analysis as well. Uh, thank you. I didn't. I didn't really expect that answer for um, Vermont to be much more have more much more racial disparity as a more liberal state. But yeah, very interesting. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Well, let me just say that Vermonters didn't expect it either, and the backlash to our research has been intense, uh, mm, yeah. especially by police chiefs, uh, by certain extremists in the state, and so forth. Uh, and uh, and it, it's it, it's quite an experience to go from being the academic to doing work in public policy and actually 
trying to, uh, to identify these processes, not just for academics and journals, but for communities. And uh, it has, our work has actually led to legislation to um, a number of things, uh, to create an, the, uh, a panel uh, hosted by the Attorney General's Office to address racial and criminal disparities in the criminal justice system. We now have an executive director at the state level to, uh, to end systemic racism. So our work has been impactful and it has been divisive. It is, it is you know, it's, there's been a real painful response to it at times. So it uh, sometimes reminds me of how much safer it is to be in the academic world than at the policy world, but it's important to take our work to the policy world so that they can use this knowledge for change. Oh yeah, definitely. You need to bring like the policy side of it to actually have any any kind of real effect. That's that's brilliant. Um, I think that is all we have time for now. Um, so thank you very much for coming coming along My pleasure. and sharing your work. Oh, I, I've really enjoyed it. I hope I hope everyone else has.